welcome to Alive and Thriving. Today I am really excited as this episode airs today, the 2nd of June, I have launched and opened up registrations for a free masterclass that I am going to be teaching specifically for women who want to come off autopilot and use EFT tapping to lighten their mental load uh, to live a more happier and more intentional life. So this masterclass is called Tap Away Your Mental Load, Clear the Noise and Thrive with EFT Tapping. Now it is free and if you join me live, you will not be disappointed. This is not going to be some fluffy introduction to EFT. We are going to be tapping together. We are going to be tapping into the present moment. We are going to be releasing emotions that are stopping you from being in the present moment. And we are going to be doing some self-discovery work. If you know me, you know I can't help but include that. Um, and really break your story. We all have a story around why you do not have time to incorporate self-care into your day. And I can tell you, for so many of you, the reason why you're not consistent with your self-care practice, be it EFT, which we're obviously specifically talking about in this masterclass, or meditation, or whatever it is that you enjoy or you want to be doing, the reason why is because you have too much going on. It is because your mental load will have you believe that you do not have time. So come and tap away your mental load with me and feel that relief. There are two dates to choose from. I will be sharing some super special bonuses and things for those who join live. Um, And if you can't make the live, then of course you can catch the replay. Now you can register uh, in my show notes or you can head to inspiredlifecollective.com.au forward slash masterclass. Now the other reason that I am so unbelievably excited is because I have a really, really special episode prepared for you guys today. Now to be honest, this was a little bit of an experiment I have put together a panel of EFT practitioners and, you know, I thought, how is this going to go? It was brilliant. Oh my goodness. This was the best conversation. Now, I know that you have heard me talk about how versatile EFT is. You've heard about my journey with EFT tapping, with anxiety uh, and, you know, how I use it in my business and how I use it as, as, you know, general well-being. But between the four of us, oh my goodness, we share so many unique ways that EFT has helped us individually, has helped our clients. We chat all about energy shifting and what that feels like and finding time for self-care and just so much goodness, so, so much goodness. So let me introduce my guests to you. So let's start with Jess Monks. When it comes to emotional regulation, Jess believes that everything is energy and energy is everything. Jess is a mum herself and when trying to support her own neurodivergent family, she found that traditional supports and interventions just weren't enough. Jess takes pride in guiding her clients to be better resourced, enabling them to support their own family energetic ecosystem no matter what the challenges they bear. Using a combination of modalities, including clinical EFT, Reiki, and access consciousness to release emotional debris and energy disturbances, Jess enables families to be able to honor their authentic selves and live a life that they can thrive in. Now, let me introduce you to Kristen Sendel. Kristen is in the process of completing her certification for EFT with the Australian Tapping Institute. Tapping has helped Kristen overcome fears and continues to help her with anxiety. Kristen loves that she's continually shown that this process works and that it can be done anywhere and at any time. She's also a sacred chocolate ceremonial. Cer- oh, let me try that again. Ceremonialia. Cer- <laughs> Can anyone say that? A sacred chocolate ceremonialist. 
it's a beautiful thing that she does. I just can't say it, which helps people allow their minds and their hearts to communicate together more fluidly. And if you, I just on a side note, if you have ever been to a cacao ceremony, it is absolutely beautiful. So I highly recommend that you find a circle near you. Um, these tools allow Kristen to help her teach people how to heal themselves and to overcome their fears to live their best lives. And finally, let me introduce you to Lane Allen. In 2022, Lane quit her eight-year corporate career to do things that she actually wanted to do for once. She has completed her advanced life coaching and EFT practitioner training at the Australian Institute And since graduating, she has been hooked on healing hotties. Um, And like your mom, she was addicted to Farmville in 2010. Outside of her humble corner of the internet, she is a very busy girl working on many different jobs. Lane conjures up some light admin. Uh, She puts the social back in social media for the Angel Phoenix and is proudly the business operations baddie for the Coco D, who is bringing financial literacy to women around the globe. Lane creates content for small business owners from social posts to ebooks and also works at the cutest cafe that you've ever seen in your life on the weekends who support local female owned businesses. When she's not tapping into her third eye, she lives her best life as podcast host for the Tap That EFT and other holistic friends podcast. She is actively unsubscribing to diet culture, doing yoga, lifting weights, and getting mad licks on the face from her dog, McNugget. Let's get into this episode. You are going to love these ladies. Let's dive in and chat about all things EFT tapping. You're listening to Alive and Thriving with Jessica Reed, the podcast that's all about empowering you to achieve optimal wellness and success through self-care, holistic practices, and raw conversations. Jessica and her expert guests are here to share powerful insights and strategies to help you overcome stress and anxiety, take charge of your life, and thrive in life and in business. Grab a cuppa and let's dive in. Welcome to this really special episode. Welcome to this really special episode of Alive and Thriving. As you heard in the introduction today, I have three phenomenal women joining me and we are going to be talking about all things EFT tapping. So welcome everybody. Hi. Hi. (laughs) Hi. This is the first time I have had more than one guest on, on the show. So if you are tuning in really super special like this is a bit of an experiment we'll see how we all go very exciting I know now you guys hear from me about tapping all the time and so I thought I wanted to bring these ladies in to really share other people's experiences other people's um, points of view uh, but just basically introduce you to the versatility of EFT I talk all the time about using it you know in the context of stress management anxiety, um, and those sorts of areas. But, you know, you're going to hear today that there are so many other ways that EFT tapping can support you. So let's get straight into it. Um, I'm going to start with, I might start with Jess. Let's go with you. (laughs) Everyone's sitting there like, oh my God, who's she? (laughs) I had my finger on the button ready to go. Amazing. Jess, welcome to Alive and Thriving. Um, really happy to have you here. Just an FYI, we have all trained, by the way, as advanced EFT practitioners at um, the Australian Tapping Institute, just so for a bit of context there. Um, Jess, I'm going to ask you, can you share with us, how were you introduced to EFT? What, what, what happened? How did you start tapping? I found tapping during a Google wormhole search looking for alternatives to support anxiety after 
almost being put in hospital because I couldn't regulate my heart um, and my blood pressure because of my anxiety and psychology it just wasn't really serving me. I was going in talking about all my pain points or my traumas and it felt like I was picking my wounds and leaving bleeding. Um, it, it felt messy and I'd leave angry as well that those things had happened. It just didn't, I didn't feel like I was getting any better. And I knew even dealing with suicidal ideation and all the things, I just, I knew that there was better. I knew there had to be more. Um, and I didn't want to continue that way. So, yep, punching in alternative anxiety support into Google, I stumbled across a video of Nick Ortner from The Tapping Solution, tapping on stage, tapping on his face, saying those words, and then I was like, this is nuts. This guy's crazy. But I could see this, I could see the audience. And I was like, all right. So laptop on my lap, here I am tapping, following them along and I felt the calm wash over my body and it was that that feeling that I'd not felt in so long. It was, yeah, it was foreign and I was like hooked straight away. I started tapping when I was getting nervous when my husband was driving the car and all the things. Like I couldn't drive on the highway back then my thought process, like driving on the Bruce highway, I was like, you only do that to die. (laughs) (laughs) I can drive on the Bruce highway and I'm about to do it after this call. So like just to, the, to watch back and who I was back then and how extreme my anxiety and depression had been to who and what I am now. It's just, it's totally changed my life. And I'm going to be forever grateful for it. Like that was a pivotal moment for me and I slowly needed to know how I could introduce this to others. And I'd started my profile before even talking to Lorna Hollander from the Tapping, um, from the Australian Tapping Institute and I just needed to share it and it's just all gone from there. Mm, amazing. I can relate to so many aspects of your story Uh, with the anxiety, I found tapping similar. Um, I was stuck in this place where I was like, I'm not functioning. Uh, The panic symptoms through my body were just so debilitating. I wasn't leaving the house. I was stuck in a freeze state. And and similar to your experience, just the psychological aspect, just talking about my wounds, like you said, it just felt like you just scratched them open. And yeah. and what I love about tapping, and sorry, just to just to take over for a sec, but what I love about tapping though is that, like you said, you felt the calm wash over your body. It's a physical, it's a physical sensation that you experience, isn't and it? So, got the power over it as well. Yeah. Like it, we can really take our control back because mm. anxiety kind of steals that from us. It does. It does. Thank you. Oh my goodness. And I love to, I, I wouldn't drive either. I was just, I would not drive either. And so, you know, if you are listening and anxiety does have, have that hold and that control over you, then, you know, hear Jess's story, hear my story. You can move through these things and tapping can help you do that. Lane, what about you? How did you become introduced to EFT? Oh, I actually, it's kind of like this cosmic catalyst effect for me. Like I, I was on afternoon shift full time at my corporate job and it was mid COVID. So I was pretty much by myself for however long. And my partner was working the day shift and I would only see him kind of like on the weekends and I just got to this place where I was just so utterly isolated and I felt like there was no community anymore. I felt so alone and I just decided that I was going to try and get myself out there a little bit more in terms of what was there in the online community space. Mm -hmm. So I actually came across, um, her name is Anna Rose. If you know her on Instagram, she has a program called self love school. And I decided to join that. And one of the things that she recommended was reading, which is something that I love doing anyway. 
um, and I wanted to incorporate, you know, more positive books into my life, reading more about um, positive psychology and things like that. Anyway, I was like in this op shop one day and I came across this book, which is called Radical Self Love by Gala Darling. And I had no idea who Gala was at that time. I just, you know, read her book in a couple of days and was like, this chick seems very interesting, very up my alley. And I was like, I wonder if, you know, she's got Instagram. And I came across her page and saw this tapping thing. And I was just like, this is so weird. Like, <laughs> no, no. But I really loved her element of community. She's got a community called The Vortex. Um, so I signed up for that. And the very first, like, community call that they had, they had Brad Yates on there and they were doing tapping and this tapping went for two hours and that was my first experience or first exposure to it God, you must and be drained at the end of that <laughs> i had to have a nap i was so tired i had to go and have like a four hour afternoon nap and i am not a napper i do not nap i was absolutely exhausted and even though like i could understand how it would work i just to be honest with you i wasn't on board straight away which is you know, fine. A lot of people aren't, a lot of people are very skeptical from, from the beginning. And it took me some time to kind of, you know, unpack and get my head around it because I was very much like this science-based person. It is science-based and that's the beauty of it too. So, um, you know, eventually just more and more exposure to it. I decided that this was something that I could potentially do as a job. I wanted to leave my corporate world because that isolation was just getting a little bit too much and I just wanted to try my own thing. And so that's how I kind of ended up in the EFT world. Wow. Oh, I love yeah. that. I love, I'm all for people leaving their corporate job yeah. <laughs> and going and doing their own thing. That is something that I am so, so passionate about. Oh, and you know, I love, and I was going to talk about this later, but just because you brought it up, um, you know, you mentioned that like you were skeptical at first and, and I know you're, you're practicing as a practitioner now. Do you find that you're coming across people being skeptical of, of tapping? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When I told people that I was going to leave my high paying, secure corporate <laughs> job to go and do this thing, they were like, what? I don't, I don't get it. And even just like having that conversation with them even trying to explain what tapping is it it's so crazy to me like how extreme they find it when mm -hmm. even today these kind of alternative modalities and holistic approaches are becoming more and more popular i i i struggle with the fact that people can't get their head around it now but you know i have to obviously show a little bit more compassion and be like that's where i was at the beginning of my journey of of this kind of work and space and yeah just holding them holding that to him yeah. yeah I think I was lucky when I found it because I was like I'm so desperate I'll try anything mm. so I wasn't <laughs> skeptical I was just like this is gonna work this is gonna work <laughs> yeah um but someone will say to me if I if I go for some sort of holistic therapy it's actually funny now when I see somebody I, I truly believe every entrepreneur needs and so and Emma Williams said this in my podcast last week as well Every entrepreneur needs a therapist and needs a coach, right? <laughs> so I have my own therapist and I've actually stopped seeing EFT practitioners and I've stopped seeing hypnotherapists because I can't stop my ego from getting in the way. I'm sort of following, oh, how would I do this? And I'm trying to sort of self-coach myself. So I've been going for other modalities for that reason so that I can surrender to the process. Mm. And I had someone say to me the other day, well, this might sound strange. And I was like, I literally tap on my face for a <laughs> living. Nothing sounds weird to me. Like, hit me with it. There was a kinesiologist. He, it was funny. He's found, uh, he found the buildup of energy right at the tip of my coccyx right at the tip of my spine so you can imagine there's an awkward space to be working and he's like this might be weird and I'm like, well, I tap on my face nothing's weird so let's just <laughs> oh thank you thank you for sharing that story how about you Kristen how did you find EFT so EFT uh, was introduced to me about six years ago I had done a vulnerable desperation type post on Facebook um, just amongst friends uh, I am arachnophobic and I've been that way for as long as I can remember and not like 
eek, a spider. I mean, like embarrassing, uncontrollable reactions. Like I've blacked out, mm. vomited, uncontrollable crying. Like, you know, as, as if being international fear wasn't bad enough, then that would happen. Mm. So I had an incident one day where it happened and I was just really, really upset. So I posted something on Facebook and a, an acquaintance of mine had commented saying, hey, like I do EFT, maybe that'll help. And I was like, look, and I didn't, I had never heard of it before. And without even really researching it, I said, yeah, let me book an appointment with you. Cause at that point I was like, I'll try anything like that desperation. Like, sure. You say tapping on my face is going to make this just a bit fine. Let's do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we met for a session. We had conversation, like it might take a little while, this and that. And um, he forewarned me that there might be some crying and that's a great way to release. And I was like, well, hand me the tissues now because that'll be fine. And thank goodness she did because uh, it was a really, really intense session. And <laughs> I cried so hard at some times, like, because we explored different triggers for me and times that it's happened, impossible experiences, why it happened. And it was probably in the top 10 of hardest cries I've had in my life. And there's some stiff competition to be there. Um, and that's not a bad thing or a scary thing. It, it was actually really amazing because after we were done, I felt so much lighter. I felt like so much had shifted that, you know, just the thought of spiders and everything like that didn't scare me so much. So we chatted and made up a little plan, like, you know, don't just go running into the woods and finding spiders. But <laughs> I lived in a rural area in Australia. Like they're going, they're everywhere. I had to get past this. So um, I went home and, you know, would see a spider out in the garden or something like, okay, I mean, I can do this and I can would find myself like being very gentle with myself, but realizing my heart rate's not going up like it used to. I'm not losing my breath like I normally would. I'm not screaming and yelling for help. And, you know, that was, like I said, about six years ago now. <laughs> and last year I got upset with my husband and one of the kids because they cleaned my favorite spiders off my sliding glass door outside. So now I've gone to the other end. I'm like, no, they're my friends and I'm saving them from the cats. And <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, wow. And yeah, isn't that just such evidence right there? Because listeners will have heard me talk about how EFT tapping sends calming and safety signals up to mm -hmm. the amygdala, which is your emotional response part of your brain. And basically we're saying this thing that you've previously deemed as being dangerous, scary, upsetting, emotionally distressing is actually safe. Yeah. And now listen, like Kristen's gone from blacking out over spiders <laughs> to now keeping them as pets. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was, uh, it's really, you know, definitely that big eye-opening experience for me. And I went into it with the notion that it might take me a couple of sessions to get there because it was such a heavy burden I was carrying. And I couldn't believe that one session was, you know, and it, well, like I said, it was a very uh, intuitive and intense session, which was amazing. And mm -hmm. it really did help guide me to being okay yeah. and I still, so many years later, I still sometimes like I'll see a spider, even if it like does something like catches me off guard and I'll see it on the, you know, in a corner or something. I'm like, oh, hey, like it doesn't. And it's like, wow, who am I? <laughs> <laughs> There's something that you mentioned too, which is um, about the cry, you know, the really, the really heavy cry. So that release, as we know, is obviously a really essential part of releasing the trapped energy and the trapped, like what, of releasing what's in your body, basically. Mm -hmm. So a release is really, really positive when it comes to EFT tapping. And I know that for some people, that's actually an aspect that scares them off any kind of therapy. I don't want to feel, I don't want to cry, you know, and, and that release is so, so important. I know with tapping, we can have all sorts of strange releases. Is the crying... And I'll get, actually, I'll get all of you to share, but for you, because Christian, because you're <laughs> unmuted, is the crying the only kind of release that you have experienced with Tuffy? No, no, my, actually, my biggest um, sign of release for me now is yawning. I, I will yawn. And it's funny because if I'm working with a client, even though I'm tapping with them for them and whatever their issue is, I'm still shifting energy with myself as well. And I'm like, look, I'm not bored with anything you're saying. I'm just moving energy too, because I'll be <laughs> yawning sometimes when I'm doing a session. 
Lane, what about you? What kind of um, what kind of shifts have you had? What kind of release? I have? definitely agree with the the yawning. That is that is mm. mine as well. That's why you got to preface it at the beginning. Be like, it's okay to yawn. It's not boring. <laughs> I know it's not boring. <laughs> but yeah, yawning and definitely the crying. But I've always been a crier, so that's not new to me. I'm fine with that. Cry it out, baby. Yeah, absolutely. Do you know, um, Jess, I'll come to you in just a second, but I know um, for me, I've, I've just explained to you guys before, I'm just coming off a two week vestibular migraine attack. And one of the things that I found through that process was I felt like I needed to cry for so many of those days and I couldn't. Um, and I wasn't in a good place for a few days. And when I could finally cry, and it was a couple of hours worth of release. But yeah, that that crying actually helped to relieve my migraine. Mm -hmm. It's it's like it's like a pressure, a pressure release. Tears are just sympathetic energy. They're just a way for your sympathetic nervous system to regulate. Another way for you to release that pent up. And for those who don't know, sympathetic meaning that stress response nervous system, it's just a way to release that. Jess, what about you? How have you? Well, some of us are so programmed to swallow those feelings. Mm. And one of the biggest interesting releases, I have had a client almost vomit in session now and I was, I, here I am in my office looking for my own bucket because if I knew if she started, I was probably going to start <laughs> too. But she'd, she'd been swallowing her feelings for that long since she was a child because she was told you can't react in those ways mm. dealing with neurodivergent people where, yeah, we've got big feelings. And when we're told that it's not appropriate, we're going to swallow them and that can create some really big issues. So yeah, the feeling, those feelings were so intense in that, in the beginning for this person that it, yeah, it was yeah. interesting. <laughs> oh my goodness. I've actually done that myself over just one situation. Um, it was interesting. I was tapping on something and every time I came to my collarbone, I felt like I was becoming nauseous and then it felt like it was rising. And I thought, oh, that's weird. I kept going around and I got back to my collarbone. And then I thought, okay, do you know what? I'm releasing. I'm going to stay here. And I threw up six times. Just, uh, uh, uh. Yeah. So um, it's, I hear that. Yeah. I hear that. And, yeah, and if you are listening, and one way or another. something to fear. Did your client feel like she had let go of years worth of heaviness after that? It was, she was exhausted afterwards, mm. just like, and that was just from being able to feel again. Yeah. Without even visiting those, the feelings that yeah. she had been swallowed. Like, yeah, it's, it's big. It it's is. Big. The release is so pivotal. And then as practitioners, what we look for as well, is the client yawning? Are they bored with the subject? You know, no. You know, well, I don't know. I've, like I said, I haven't had a client vomit like you, but I have vomited. Um, but also people get gassy. Have you had anyone get mm -hmm. gassy? Yes. <laughs> so I always say, because um, I host a monthly tapping circle and I always say like, afterwards, like, don't worry. <laughs> if this is what's happening for you, it's okay. <laughs> I you always know? start off with a precursor. Like, these yeah. are all signs of release. Burping, <laughs> crying, laughing. Mm -hmm. Um it, especially if it feels like it's, it's inappropriate, you know, the yawning, all of that stuff is released. If it's coming out of the body, let it out of the body. Yeah. And I find as a practitioner, I often doing big, more trauma kind of sessions, I'll sweat. Mm -hmm. So I can tell that if my clients had big shifts, because I'll be, I'll be sweaty mm -hmm. afterwards. So it's interesting, like where we're really, we're processing this energy with our clients as well. Like it's why, We've got the ability to do so much healing in ourselves with these modalities, but when you're with a practitioner, they are really, they're, they're doing it with you. And there's true magic in that, I think. I, I really I love like in. the analogies that come along with it. Like for people that, you know, maybe don't speak their truth, they get the sore throat. For people who feel like the pressure of the world, they get sore shoulders and like that weight of the world on their shoulders. Like, I really love that stuff. Like that, that trips me out. That's really cool. Oh, when you start getting deep into the body and the body psychotherapy and what the different areas of the body are saying and then how to release, oh my goodness, I can actually share an example of that 
for me yesterday in this process of releasing the migraines um, and the panic attacks that came with the migraines that I haven't experienced to that degree for a long time. Um, I had a theta healing session the other day and at the end of it, I had something come in and it was about fear and it was right at the end of the session. And so yesterday I thought, okay, I did some meridian tracing and I found that when I traced my small intestine meridian, I got up to my ear and it was really warm, really, really hot. And in the healing session the day before, she'd said, I'm sensing something around your ears. So I had been getting tinnitus, like really bad ringing in my ears and this full pressure in my ears. So I thought, okay, well, that's where I'm going to start to release this fear using my body. My body is telling me something's going on in my ears. So then I was able to use the small intestine point um, and tap. And I spent so long on that one point until I felt like that had released from me. So it is, it's getting into the body. What is my body trying to tell me? Am I listening to it? How can I help my body to release it? It is so, so phenomenal. And I'm so happy that you brought that up, Lane. Lane, let's, can you tell me? And I'm just curious because we had a bit of a chat before about the versatility of tapping and different things that people have used it for. What sort of things, what's like some unique or just everyday things, what sort of things have you used tapping for for yourself and for clients? And is there anything that's like, oh, that's a bit out of the box. <laughs> um, I think for me, like I, because I was so skeptical at the beginning, it took me a while to even want to like just tap on myself. Like I've, I think practitioners probably find it a lot easier to work with somebody else than they do on themselves, like willing to go deep on themselves. And so for me, like I incorporate tapping every single day. I start my morning off with three things, which is breath work, tapping and some form mm -hmm. of stretching. And so even if it's just like five minutes, whatever is like heavy on my heart that day or what I'm trying to, you know, call in, whatever the case might be. For me personally, the biggest kind of like aha moment came from this tapping session. Like I'm I've, I've been, a, I had been a smoker for a really long time, like over 10 years. And I couldn't really understand like, like why, and why I was struggling so hard to, to quit smoking. I haven't smoked in about five months now, which has been great. However, the realization that came from that for me was the fact that I use smoking as a connection tool to the two people in my life who abandoned me. Mm -hmm. And that was my ex stepdad. He was a part of my life for 13 years and he was a smoker. And when he and my mum separated, he still saw my brother and my sister, but he didn't see me. Mm -hmm. And then the other person was my grandmother who she didn't intentionally abandon me. She had very early onset dementia and she got that in her early forties actually. And she passed away um, quite young, um, but her and I had a really close relationship and my mum and I did not. And so I felt really abandoned by these two people in my life who were both smokers and that connection to smoking was kind of like, well, to them was through smoking cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And when I kind of had that realization, it made it a lot easier to quit because I was able to release that emotional relationship and emotional connection of abandonment that I had to both of them. Um, so that's probably been my like biggest aha moment for myself for sure. Wow. Mm. How about you, Jess? Anything come to mind? Hmm. There's been so many. Mm. There's been so many. Um, weird and wonderful. Is that what we're doing? Yeah. Weird and wonderful. And you can include a, a big aha moment in there too, if you like. <laughs> I think being able to help neurodivergent people with their sensory um, aversions mm -hmm. has been really cool. Sort of getting it, similar to exposure therapy, I guess, but getting them to imagine those things that really irk them and releasing the irk. Yeah. And it's as simple as that. And it creates such a difference in their world. Um, I can't even, yeah, I don't even have words to explain it, but like I've got a client who couldn't touch cardboard. So things like a brown paper bag that you get at 
Woolworths or pizza boxes, she couldn't hold with her hands because that feeling would make her, uh, I want to spew again, I'm sorry, guys, but <laughs> we could, like cover her hands so she could hold it and all the things. And then we did this session on just that. And um, that afternoon I got photos of her holding pizza boxes, like she was able to go in and collect the pizza boxes herself. Yeah. Imagine having something that simple irking you so much all the time, like yeah. when you've already got all these other triggers as well. So just creating ease, I think, um, when you've got those extra challenges is like I just love what we get to do. We're so lucky. We're I so love lucky. how you, when you explained releasing the irk um, and for anybody who listens to this through YouTube, they'll be able to see you. When sometimes when we've got to release something, there's no words for it, right? It's just, it's a body thing. And so, and that's what tapping is so good at mm. is releasing the things, you know, I can't sit in a session and explain how listening to my dog licking makes me feel, but I can certainly do that with my body. <laughs> and it yeah. is, it's releasing the, ugh, it's releasing the, ugh, it's releasing the, ugh, like it's releasing those things yeah. um, that makes such a big difference. It's but I so love that she can touch cardboard. Yeah, and it's those body sensations that we do need to focus on. We can call them whatever we want. Mm. And it's like the emotion wheel, those labels can all be there. But until we really start looking at how that feels to us on the inside and we're all different, thinking that it's one label for one feeling, it's so not. We all feel everything so, so differently and... I think if we start listening to those sensations that we do feel in our body, yeah. what is our yes? What is our no? What is our, what does anxiety feel to us? What does happy, sad, joy, like those things that we're wanting to call in, do we even know what they feel like first mm. to us? Let's go from there and start like building bridges to get there sort of thing. So we're calling in that vibe and feeling it already. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just, when he said, what does happy feel like? I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> but you're, you're right. We have to be able to embody it. And we have mm-hmm. to be able to also feel the release, feel what we need to release as well. Yeah. So important. Kristen, what about you? I know that you've worked with arachnophobia for yourself. Have you come across or just even in your day-to-day using EFT? Um, you know, what sort of different things are you using it for? Um, uh, so the arachnophobia that first time was absolutely my aha, this really works moment for sure. But I think right now, currently what I'm using it for most often is my son races go-karts. Um, he's 13 and it's getting very competitive and he's, he's good. And, but it's also very scary because they're going 105 kilometers an hour in these go-karts. So <clears throat> I have found myself pretty much every time on the sidelines watching his race tapping on my chest and like oh calm down calm down I'm gonna be okay (laughs) because it gets uh you know that parental thing those feelings of just you can't do anything about it except watch now he's got to go do his thing and it's really exciting and I'm really proud of him but the anxiety is definitely peaking in those moments Mm so I use it a lot now for um just those spikes in my anxiety especially during times like that where nothing's going to actually make me feel great in that very moment, but it's going to, it gets me through. I don't know what I would do if I wasn't (laughs) sitting there just tapping on my chest. Oh, I call that emotional first aid. You're just (laughs) using it to spot fire those moments where you really need it. I I love the versatility and I don't talk about it enough, the versatility of tapping. Like when I think about how I might use it, I might use it in my business nervous about doing a live, you know, or nervous about, um, you know, interviewing someone who I perceive to be really, uh, really cool or, um, you know, or I'm comparing myself to someone else, not staying in my own lane. Um, So many things, so many different mindset challenges, as well as the big stuff, as well as, you know, the grief, as well as the stress, as well as the anxiety and the panic and the physical disturbances. Yeah, absolutely. And to build on that and what you and Jess were kind of talking about before too, one of the things I love about tapping is sometimes we can't define that feeling or what it is that we need to release, but with tapping, you can do it anyway. 
So I can be feeling, maybe I'm feeling anxiety for something, but I'm not sure what, or maybe I don't know why I'm feeling <clears throat> whatever I'm feeling. And you can still shift that energy. You don't always have to give something a name or a feeling. You know, you can say, my stomach hurts. And you can work on that and move it around. And I think that's one of the things that I is a really great, almost hidden gem about tapping is that it doesn't always have to have a name or something specific. You can still move the energy and you can still shift things. Yeah, absolutely. When you talk about, when you say moving energy, I think for some listeners, you might be thinking, what does that mean? Or what does that feel like? I know we talked about having a big release earlier. That's obviously a, a big energy shift and that's really notable. But if you were just tapping on something that wasn't so major, that didn't, um, that your body didn't need to release a, a big heap of tears or a heap of gas or something, you know, um, what, what does an energy shift? And again, I know everybody is different, but Kristen, for you, could you explain when you say, you know, I'm shifting energy, what does that feel like for you? I think the overall winning feeling in shifting energy is just a general feeling of being lighter. You know, we talk about feeling that heaviness and giving it a million names, whether it's feeling depressed or carrying the world on your shoulders. You know, when you can take a deep breath and go, oh, I can breathe a little bit easier. That's a huge energy shift for me personally. Another one is sometimes I just, I just feel stagnant. I don't really necessarily, you know, it could be everything because every day-to-day -day life, we have a million stressors coming at us all of the time. And I just feel really tight and just, I don't know if I want to scream or cry or what to do. So I shut down and tapping kind of just helps me open that flow up. And that's what I mean when I'm shifting energy. I'm like unclogging the filters a bit. Mm. And I can just be more in flow with whatever's going on in my life and take a deep breath and be like, okay, I got this. Whatever it is, I can do this. Yeah. And that's just how it is for me. I love that. And, you know, Jess may go deeper on this, um, talking about energy, but, uh, you know, emotion is just energy in motion. And as it moves through the body and as it moves through the meridians that we're tapping on and we're creating that flow through our chakras as well, you are literally moving what is stagnant, what is heavy within your body. Jess, did you want to explain yeah, what that? is stuck? Like, and as you said, emotions are energy in motion. And if we're walking around holding on to all of our emotional debris from that we've acquired from any of our life experiences. I want to highlight that it's not just the big T traumas that make pivotal impact on our lives. Some things that we hold on to quite often from that six, seven age area, um, teachers' comments, so many teachers' comments we've held on to um, and taken that story as gospel. But being able to release that, the, the, the emotional attachment to all those things, um, yeah, massive, massive. Absolutely. And we've got it at the tip of our fingers. Like we're able to have our clients use it in between sessions so they're able to manage their day-to-day -day stresses, which allows us to kind of really do that, the biggest stuff, or do the digging for them. Mm, it's so crazy to think that you could be holding on to that stuff for so many years and yet in a 45 minute session maybe an hour maybe even two sessions that all of that can be gone yeah. and dr kim Duramo, i was at mind heart connect which was for eft practitioners a couple of weeks ago and dr kim Duramo said you're literally one tweak away from having all that you desire and that one tweak for us is the EFT space. Like five minutes of tapping can shift so many years of pent up frustration, guilt, trauma, shame, whatever you want to call it, whatever emotion. And to be able to think that you can literally change your whole entire life in that space is just wild. And it's like, why wouldn't you want to give it a go? You know? Yeah, absolutely. And I think even going deeper on that as well, what so many people don't realize is we think of our emotion as something being separate to our health, or we think about our mental health as being separate to our physical health. And we forget about 
the impact that these heavy emotions, that these toxic emotions actually cause on the cells within our body, causing a toxic environment for them to thrive, creating a dis-ease in the body, you know, leading to long-term illness, leading to diseases, leading to a decline in physical health. And so you you can create your the life that you want to create. You can create the emotional state that you want to create. But you can also, by doing that, remembering that our mind and body are, are one. You know, the body mind it all resides within subconscious. All resides within the body. That you can actually create your physical health state as well. It's just that's a bit fascinating. Sorry. Absolutely, no go. It, it that's so spot on and it's sometimes crazy when we stop and think about the fact that that's not really considered common knowledge that connection between the emotion and the physical because on a basic level we do we know when we're sad that emotion makes us physically cry yes. you know when we're really stressed out that emotion can make us have headaches so on such a basic simple level we understand that and accept that generally in society but on that massive level it's you know it's real it, and it absolutely is that connection to the mind and body and the emotions absolutely and the energy and the energy i think we forget about well, we forget as a society about about that because for some people that's classified as woo woo <laughs> And it's, and it's, you know, and it's so, it is so heavily proven now. Mm. But it's like, we, we used to be like that, right? Like we used to have such a huge connection to the mind, body, spirit, to the cosmos, to nature, to everything. And it's kind of like, we're back in this space now where we're unlearning the last however many hundred years of that programming, that programming that we have been taught through the education system, through our environment now, you know, we're all running around so stressed, wanting to be the most productive person on the planet. And it's just not feasible. And it's actually projecting in the opposite direction of where we're all trying to go collectively now, which is like coming back to ourselves and coming back together as a community. And yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. Yes, you work with you you you're a bit like me, multiple modalities that kind of just blend together to come out and help people. So you correct me if I'm wrong, you you use EFT, um, Reiki, access consciousness. When you blend all of these together, how do you find that impacts people in your practice? I think it just proves how we are just these human beings like transmitting and processing energy Um, and even working in the neurodivergent space I think especially over the last 12 months I've had a real eye-opener as to how a lot of their challenges are how we're processing that energy Mm. auditory sensitivities it's all it's all energy Um, so if we're able to encourage or embrace as much or as many different tools to manage our energy, then we're going to be able to manage better in life. We'll be able to see that certain areas or environments may be more challenging to our to our nervous systems, to our beings, and we're going to be able to either support or give ourselves that downtime afterwards so we can just be like, whoa, that was a lot, like just went to a shopping centre or, Um, but I think when we are struggling so often one modality may not be quite enough. Mm. So to be able to create, I guess, just more things that we can lean on. Yeah. So we've got that power. I think right now as well, energetically, we are all trying to take our power back. So if us as practitioners are able to teach our clients how to use things in different ways and to explore and, I guess, embrace different learnings that we pick up along the way from each and every modality as well. It's just, it all goes, it all goes into one and well, we are all one. So yeah, everything is energy and energy is everything. And Jess, you work, correct me if I'm wrong, but you work with children as well, don't you? 
Yeah, I do. Yeah, so how do you find them being receptive? I know I've got a lot of um, mums um, who listen to this podcast. So, um, you know, we talk about how we use EFT for ourselves, but how do you find how do you find children? Is there any age that you think is too in just in your experience? How, um, how do you about kids? I like to teach. I like to teach children how to use the modalities as their own superpower. Mm. And I start with teaching them how to use it themselves while we're building that rapport. And it gives them that space that once we've connected, if there's particular feeling that they feel quite regularly, they feel comfortable to share that and we can work with that in the moment and let it go. Um, But having them be able to acknowledge that everything is energy as well, like they've got this power. And if there's been an instance where something's happened and it's weighing on their heart, they've got the power that they can go and like let it go when they choose to. So I think we can start encouraging our children to tap from really quite young, like toddler. My daughter was four when she started, when I found tapping, so I taught it to her straight away. And she would be at kindy and she'd get overwhelmed and she was taking herself to the TP to go and tap. Her teachers told me this. And then she'd go have a little tap and then be able to go and play with her friends afterwards. So this was even before she was diagnosed autistic, that she's been able to embrace this tool. She's eight now. She doesn't tap at all, if I'm honest. But she's that seed's been planted, and I've probably ruined it a little bit in my house because that's what mum does. That's her job. Yeah. Right? So I, I, I think I'm at eight, at eight to... they're like the mini teenagers. Like I don't, yeah. I don't want anything to do with that. That's yeah. beautiful. I can relate. My um, Amelia, who's my youngest, she started tapping. Um, she started copying me when she was about eighteen months, and I had this video of her just tapping on her face, and then I said how do you feel? And she goes, I feel good. (laughs) But my eldest was about five when I learned, oh, four, no, she was four too, actually, when I learned EFT. And I did teach it to her straight away. We would tap together sometimes. Now when she's heightened at home, I might say, you know, let's do something. And she's just like, no, mom, don't want to borrow you. But she says to me, um, she gave a speech at school the other day. Uh, to be elected for the Student Representative Council, uh, which she won. It was so really great for her. But she said, Mum, I was I was sitting, oh, she was doing this, she was sitting there tapping on the side of her hand while she, with her hand in her lap waiting for her turn to speak. And then I heard a story that she was at school and one of her friends was upset and she said, don't worry, I know how to fix you. <laughs> Love that. Tell me what's wrong and I'm going to teach you to tap. Yeah. And I just thought, so whilst, yeah, I'm getting that pushback at home, like you said, being mum, doing what I'm doing. Um, but I know that it is a seed that is that has been planted and that she's watering um, and trying to fix everyone, which we might need to yeah. talk about, but, you know. <laughs> and we can beautiful. surrogate tap for our children too when they, when, when we have taught them and they, if they are resistant, we've got the we've got, we can help release it. And also, I want to if we let go of our emotional attachments towards them being triggered and un- upset, it just starts clearing that energetic space for more flow, more positivity, more the light and airy feelings to come in. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So I'm going to move around the room and I'm going to ask you guys, do you have a favorite tapping point? Is there one that you just love, something that you just find really soothes you or is it more in the moment for you, depending on what's going on? Kristen, we'll start with you. I would definitely say the collarbone for me is my go-to. Um, and I don't know if I picked that up, maybe even a little bit from Lorna at the Australian Tapping Institute, because I know that's also her favorite space. But um, yeah, just, I don't know, I guess whenever you're nervous or the anxiety, so my anxiety and nerves, you know, that's a big thing for me, but I could, so, you know, you just sit there and that's a calming thing to tap on your chest and whether it's fingers or a whole hand, I just, I don't know, I find it very soothing. What about you, Lane? I think that the side of the eye and under the eye 
is just for me. I just like the sensation that it gives, Mm. but yeah. I sometimes will lay down and I'll start at my eyebrow and I'll just lay on my back and I'll just tap around on the eyebrow around that bone, side of eye, under eye. I go up to the bridge of my nose and then I just Mm. go back around and I just keep doing that and it is so good. (laughs) So soothing. Jess, do you have a favourite? Collarbone's my favourite as well, purely because if I, in the moment, if I'm feeling heightened, I don't have the capacity or the space to think of much else. Mm. So remembering that I'm safe and surrounded by love in that moment when I am feeling heightened, because I still have anxiety. It's still a thing. It hasn't gone away. I just know how to manage it now. Mm. But collarbone governs hypersensitivity and adrenal, so it's going to calm me down straight away and I'm able to just remind myself I'm safe and surrounded by love and within seconds really I can feel it coming back down Mm, I love that it's also the most like oblivious one like as (laughs) as Lorna had once said like you can do it on the train you know just under your shirt collarbone for sure Yeah. yeah Lane, can I ask you, I know that um you know listeners would have heard in the bio that you have a lot going on in terms of the different things that you're doing you mentioned at the beginning and I I know so many people relate to that you know from multiple jobs or business and jobs to balancing family balancing kids and so a lot of the one of the biggest things that I hear really in any in any self-care aspect is I don't have time I don't have time and so coming from someone who I don't like to use the word busy but for lack of a better word who who is probably pretty busy, right? <laughs> you mentioned at the beginning every day you've got your three non-negotiables, which I see you do on, I see you do those on social media. For anybody listening who's like, I'm too busy, too busy to tap, what would you say to them and what advice would you give them to help them to incorporate a tool such as EFT or another tool that they enjoy? What would you say to them? I definitely think it's also about the, like the language that you use, like changing the, I don't have enough time. That's just going to be a constant state for everything. Then Mm -hmm. like, you don't have enough time to hang out with your kids. You don't have enough time to do the washing. You don't have enough time. It's more so changing that language and being like, it's not a priority for me at this point. So when you start to say like tapping is not a priority for me or doing this thing is not a priority for me, you start to register and go, okay, my mental health is not a priority for me. Mm. My physical health is not a priority for me. And mm. having that shift of language, it just like <laughs> changes I that know. Oh, I was just thinking of myself saying that, like, well, I don't have time. But when you do that shift, it's yeah. not a priority. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. And I, I can empathize to a degree. Like I'm not a mother, but I understand that I really, I hate that saying that that saying that used to go around and it was like, you have the same amount of hours in the day as Beyonce, like you can get it done. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, babe, Beyonce's got a personal trainer and a chef and a personal assistant, like all the help in the world. But I, again, I think when you change your perspective and change your language, you start to realize what is important to you. Mm. And I do think that even five minutes, like five minutes is not that that long um you know five minutes of your day where you can just find a little bit of peace and quiet by yourself pretend you're on the toilet whatever the case might be and just give yourself that five minutes to do something for you in that moment and again it doesn't have to be tapping it can be you know just deep heavy heavy breathing it can just be mind being mind mindful in the moment and just taking that five minutes and then building on it when you feel like it's appropriate when you go okay I need I need more time now and just keep building on it and building on it and building on it Mm -hmm. and changing things when they also don't work for you like I understand that tapping again tapping is not for everyone and we're not here trying to like advocate and be like everyone needs to tap you know it works for us everyone's unique though and so if if it's not tapping then it's five minutes of breath work or it's five minutes of stretching and then my big three and they might change you know i might not want to do those in in a week's time and being okay with that and not being tied to it emotionally as well and just being like okay i've done that for however long now i can move on to the next thing that's going to serve me in this moment 
I love that. And I know you do a lot on social media. What about, say, somebody who has a business and maybe they're scared of putting themselves out there? How would you encourage them to explore tapping to support themselves through that? For sure. I mean, I'm a huge advocate for social media and the proper use of social media. You know, we need to go in that space with the mindset of wanting to be in community. And if you have your own business, you want to show up for your community and you want to be there for them. And you, I think it's really, really important to remember that you have your own story and your own way of doing things. Like people want to say that the market's saturated in whatever field that they're interested in and they're really struggling to find their niche or whatever the case might be. But I think that people forget that there's someone out there that needs to hear what you have to say, because I think, you know, you could be told 99 times that you're beautiful, you're amazing, you know, the sun shines out of your butt, whatever the case might be, but you're not gonna believe that until maybe like the hundredth person that tells you. And if you can be that hundredth person for somebody else, like that's a huge thing for them. You know, you're changing someone's life just by being yourself and being in your space of business and showing up. So that's really, really important. And I strongly encourage doing a bit of tapping before, you know, Jess mentioned earlier, tapping before doing a live, maybe. If you're nervous about something um, that requires you to be seen, I completely empathize. And a lot of people empathize as well, but you wanna be in that 1% that is showing up for their community. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, highly, highly encourage you to get out there and just bite the bullet and do it anyway, because you're in that 1% of people that are actually showing up so absolutely and just on that as well I guess tapping on the story too you know we've spoken a lot about naming our emotions we've spoken a lot about feeling it in our body but you can also literally tap and say I have this story that I you know I'm going to stuff this up I have this story that no one wants to hear from me I have this story and you can tap on your story too because that is still going to be bringing that safety to that as well Absolutely. I'm going to go around the room one more time and I am going to ask you guys if you have heard what is the strangest misconception around AFT. Maybe it's a question you've been asked. Maybe it's just something that you've heard. What is the strangest misconception around AFT that you've heard and how would you correct that? <laughs> Anyone want to go first? Jess, go for it. <laughs> if you can figure out where the unmute yeah, is. <laughs> I think the biggest misconception and I, um, people are quite often surprised that we do bring attention to the pain point first mm. before we even like, yeah, even though we have this problem, we bring the problem to the forefront first. So often we shine away from those problems because we don't want to give it energy. Yeah. But with EFT, when we are using EFT, we are shining a light on that problem so we can trigger those feelings within us, those sensations that we were talking about before, and then we're able to clear them. So we need to be able to shine a light on those those problems rather than turning a blind eye to them. Mm, do you know, I actually would completely agree with you. That is one of the biggest things that I, one of the biggest resistances that I would get is why do I want to focus my energy and my attention on the negative? Um, And I think so much, I can attribute so much to that. There's actually a fear for a lot of people that if, um, and that comes from that real like toxic positivity message um, around a misinterpreted law of attraction in this sense, that if I focus on my problem, I'm going to get more of my problem. Yeah. And so I can completely hear that. Whereas, yeah. first of all, without the acceptance, we can't actually let go of the problem. So that's why we start there, like you said. And, and finding a line and allowing it. those shifts in your body. Yeah. Like you well, said. and if we don't let go of it, we're only going to rinse and repeat the pattern. Yeah. So whatever whatever thing it is that's going on, it may ease if you don't face it, but it's likely to come back. And when it does, it might come back worse. Yeah. So dealing with it when it is a problem in that moment can be really beneficial. Absolutely. And also when we think about from that like energetic uh, energetic law of attraction perspective as well, if you are harboring these low vibrational emotions, 
then that is the frequency that you're actually more likely to be putting out to the universe subconsciously. And so consciously your brain's like, I don't want to talk about this. I'm going to attract more of it. Yeah. But um, yeah, really it's, that's not the case. You're a walking low vibrational. (laughs) (laughs) Clean up your stuff. (laughs) I think um, the whole EFT in general, and I think I said it earlier as well, just like people just not, really understanding the mechanics of how it works and therefore just not really even wanting to engage with it and you know i've got so many clients in their first initial meeting at the end of it they are like blown away at how much of a shift or or what has shifted for them you know thinking about the start and being like this is not something that I really wanted to do. I just thought it was weird. And I just wanted, I, I literally just booked because I wanted to see what it was about and not really um, realizing how much of it was actually going to come up for them. You know, a simple, a simple issue 45 minutes later is something that happened to them in their childhood and they're just like blown away by it. So I just think the, the, the misconception of, you know, meridian energies in general, like people not, not really understanding that those meridians are actually real, they're physical, they're in your body, they do exist, they're not made up, um, you know, just even getting to that that point of, of trying to get people across the line and being like, no, no, they're physical, they're real, they're here. You've got an energetic highway in your body. Yeah, in your body, it's there. <laughs> you, you're experiencing a bit of a traffic jam right now. We need to clear some up. <laughs> And we are those traffic controllers. Yeah. yeah. We can create ease. Yeah. Kristen, what about you? Have you come across any major misconceptions? Gosh, I'm not sure if it's one of those moments where there was nothing happening in my brain and then a million things were happening in my brain. At once. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, I think that it's a general consent or maybe not just with tapping, but even overall with what is considered alternative um, therapies, modalities, and medicines is it gets underestimated, you know? I mean, I was a bit guilty too at first. Like I said earlier, like, oh, you're telling me that I'm going to tap on my face and I'm not going to be afraid of spiders anymore. Well, how can that happen? And people think that if they're skeptic of it, they shouldn't try it. And I think that the opposite is true. When you're, if you, skepticism is good. That means that you're thinking about it and you're at least curious about it in some form. So, you know, don't be like, oh, I don't believe in that, so I can't try it. Well, actually, no, that's not true at all. You can, as long as you're open enough to say, all right, I'll see what the next hour happens or, you know, 45 minute session or whatever, you know, don't don't be afraid. Be like, all right, well, what can you do, you know? And following up with that, I think, you know, the biggest misconception might be that people think I'm doing the work. I'm not the one healing you. I'm not the one helping you release anything. I'm just there to guide you to finding out what you're the one doing the work. You're the one that has all of the power. Each individual has, they're holding the key to healing themselves. Yeah. Wow. I was just going to add something. Yeah. Like what Kristen was saying about being skeptical and just wanting to give it a go we all know what happens when we don't try, you know, we don't grow, we don't progress. We don't become a new version of ourselves. We don't allow the world to see us at our fullest potential. So what is the harm of trying? Like there's absolutely like nothing, nothing wrong with just giving something a go. And if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. That's fine. You gave it a crack. But I always say, like, you always got to try things twice because the first time might have been a shit one. So, <laughs> um, Ladies, I have enjoyed every bit of this conversation. Just before we wrap up, I would love for you all to share where people can find you. And just so you know, I'm linking everything in the show notes. So there will be links to websites. But where can we find you? How can we work with you? Jess, you go. Come and find me at The Tapping Space, mostly on Instagram. And you can 
work with me via the energies field. I do distance healings, online healings, and um, yes, I help support families, energetic ecosystem, whether you are neurodivergent or neurotypical, but um, because I'm neurodivergent, I do tend to draw that crowd, <laughs> um, but yeah, come and find me. Amazing. Lane, how about you? You can find me on Instagram at eft.lane, L-A-I-N-E, or my website, which is www.eftlane.com. And you can work with me one-on-one. I have a program coming out soon all about body acceptance, which I'm super excited about. So yeah, hope to see you there. Amazing. And Kristen, where can we find you? So right now, the best place to find me is on Instagram, just Kristen Sendel. Um, you can see the spelling in the show notes, I'm sure. Yeah, and um, be linked. <laughs> yeah, perfect. So I, I um, haven't launched a website or Instagram for a business yet. That's all coming a little bit later this year. But yeah, just starting everything kind of new and some new projects that I'm working on there. So amazing. So follow Kristen to watch this space. That's exciting. Oh, ladies, thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom, for your beautiful energy. I have loved this conversation. And yeah, I just thank you so much for joining me on Alive and Thriving today. Thank Thank you you so much. Thanks, ladies. Having us. Wow, what a journey it's been today. We are so grateful for each and every one of you who tuned in to Alive and Thriving. If you enjoyed this episode and want to help us keep growing, please consider subscribing and leaving a review on your favorite platform. It's a simple but powerful way to support a small business like ours to continue to make an impact.